Guam Board of Medical Examiner member and president of the Medical Society. And I've worked uh, be in, in Saipan and, have a, and of course Hawaii and have a great deal of familiarity with the region and how things work. So <clears throat> let me start. Um, so how did COVID get to Guam? How did it all start? Well, it started more or less in March, possibly earlier. The strain on Guam was identified as coming from China, then to India. This is the initial strain, the Philippines, and then it landed on Guam. At this point, there's probably a co-mixing of the uh, strain from the U.S., which is a bit from many places in the U.S., which has a, a mutation which allows it to be more infective, but possibly a little less, a little less uh, lethal, so to speak. <clears throat> I think everybody is familiar with this graph, um, the SEER model, which is called the Susceptible Exposed Infectious Recovered Projection, which started the panic. <clears throat> this was released by members of the Physician Physicians Advisory Group, and it, it's kind of a plug and play program. You can just download it off uh, the internet and start putting in numbers and it kind of grow, grows this graph. Now, the problem is these graphs are designed for the average area in the world. Uh, Guam is unique. It's a confined island. It's got, it's multi-ethnic, mostly Asian. It's got thermal considerations. People live in different densities. And this may, and obviously this was not applicable because by now we should have had well over 1,000 hospitalizations and of those well over 200 deaths, if not more. Okay, the confirmed cases on Guam, we've all seen that. I don't wanna bore you. Uh, just please note after August 8th, as you see the increase in cases. Okay, now this is something most people don't look at and with places like, um, decision makers in um, Florida looked at. And this is the trend for positive rates. Not, we're not talking about absolute cases, positive rates and death rates. And these are percentages. And without getting into the actual numbers, you can see this number having an increased slope. This is the number of, this is the um, positive, positivity rate, and this is the case, this is a fatality rate. This is the trend for Hawaii. Again, a lockdown jurisdiction, a lockdown state. You can see if you can, it's hard to make out, but the trend on the bottom is actually increasing as is uh, the trend on the top, the infection rate. And that's the infection rate to identify it is when they say, for example, there are 50 positive cases of 500 tests, then the infection rate is 10%. Okay, it was hard to find like areas for Guam. Again, Guam is unique, and a lot of the models that are put out are done by AI. There probably isn't an individual responsible for um, computing. I mean, in the, you know, that I can identify who solely focused on Guam. I even tried to get a hold of the epidemio epidemiologist, and it was very difficult to do so. And I think, as you've read, they don't have the funding for this to be done. So I had to look for like jurisdictions where in U.S. systems that are that have access to funding and medical care. So um, I had a colleague who was in the U.S. Virgin Islands. He said medical care is similar to Guam. Um, and you can see the trends for the Virgin Islands. Now, Virgin Islands are broken up into many islands. You kind of see the slope um, quivering. It's had some lockdowns, but you can see the bottom slope, the death rate increased. The infectivity rate has kind of gone down. Again, some of that is a result of testing. Okay, now here's Florida, where I am located right now. Florida, as you know, is full bore open for business. Um, there really was no lockdown. The governor basically rec made some recommendations, left it up to the counties and the mayors. Some of the counties left it up to the mayors. And um, really, the only establishments where the hammer came down were alcohol only establishments because they were packing beyond fire code. And then there were some traceable outbreaks. 
So it was mostly young people, mostly by the beach. And, you know, to them, it was still, uh, you know, spring break mentality. So for good reason, alcohol only establishments were shut down. Once they were able to bring food into the premises and behave, they were systematically opened. And about a month, about three, two or three weeks ago, they were all open, including the breweries and the distilleries. Okay, now let's take a couple comparisons aside from Guam, just US jurisdictions. This is Arkansas. Arkansas was a no lockdown, um, no lockdown state. And you can see it really is virtually flatlined. And here's a different state, here's Iowa. Iowa was a no lockdown state, bit more population dense. And you can see the infectivity rate is going up, but the death, the fatality rate is going down. And now you see California, which had a fairly successful lockdown in the sense that the infectivity rate dropped, but the, infection, the fatality rate has increased. And New York, which had an atrociously heavy lockdown, and you can see it was rather successful. But you're talking about an almost entire period of lockdown where everything is locked down and uh, the economy there is obviously crippled. And there's also depopulation occurring. Okay, now let's look, let's start looking at um, points in time, which may um, be meaningful. The red, I, well, I'm not good at this, so I couldn't put a clean arrow, but that's roughly the time Honolulu started its most recent lockdown. There were a number of iterations of lockdowns beforehand in one form or another, but this is the entire state and all the islands. So if you went to Honolulu, it would be more dramatic, but you can see that after they started the lockdown, the infectivity rate began to increase, as did the mortality rate, which is, again, the line on the bottom. Here's the U.S. Virgin Islands. That red arrow is the approximate lock, most recent lockdown rate. It's, it's interesting because many of these places started their heavy lockdowns, and I'm not being political, um, but they're demo, it seems like democratic jurisdictions kind of got their, you know, kind of did things in coordination. This, uh, they lock, Virgin Islands locked down around the 23rd and Guam around the 20th and so did Honolulu around the 20th. So you can see again, an increase in mortality and a slight decrease in infectivity rate, which again could be testing error. Now here's Guam, all right? I've done my best to insert that arrow at approximately the 20th of August. Now you can see that you can see the infectivity rate and the mortality rate are climbing dramatically and continue to climb. This is from yesterday, um, I where, I, where I, I had to figure out how to freeze it, but this same today, if you go to the, you go to the Mayo Clinic website from which this is derived. And here, of course, is the confirmed cases on Guam. And once again, I've marked the point where the lockdown started and it's all over the place. And when you look at these, you kind of get lost. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, it's like earthquake spikes. You just look at the spikes and forget that there are other matters such as hospitalizations, mortalities, etc. And I won't get into that because I only have a few minutes to discuss this. So I think it's fairly obvious that looking at what other, I mean, looking at not only infection rates, but looking at the infectivity rate, the percentage of people who are infected, and you can see it increasing, as well as the case fatality rate, they have been steadily increasing since the lockdown. Now, there are a number of reasons for this, and most, it's very hard to find successful lockdowns, but when they're done, they are done way, way in the beginning during the first cases where there maybe are just a few clusters and there is no evidence of sustained community transmission. And when Guam's most recent lockdown occurred, and this is part of the, what, 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 where you would have challenges in, 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 in justifying it, there was already widespread uh, sustain and sustained community lockdown. And what happened shortly afterwards was um, 
there was an increase. And let me just, uh, let me see if I get to the right. Okay, so there's your increase, of course, of cases. Now, um, before I get into the meat of this, I talked to some doctors and, cer and certain doctors who were tracking it reported within 10 to 14 days of the lockdown, having a quadrupling of family cases. Now we're not able to see the data from public health, but what was kind of mentioned by a few people who were in a position to know is that there was an increase in family clustering. And that's what's, what happens. You take a house that was minimally populated most of the time, and there may have been some youthful asymptomatic spreaders who now have nothing to do. They have no work, they have nowhere to go, they have no money. So they're sitting in the house and to save money, they're recirculating the air conditioning. And the virus, a locked in virus is a happy virus. If it doesn't get grandma this time, well, uh, it'll get her tomorrow because they're living inside the people in the house who have nowhere else to go. And your numbers, people, it's all a matter of, of timing when the infected person is having contact with others. Anyway, you can see it manifest. So success, as in the Lancet, successful lockdowns for COVID-19 in similar environments, and they broke out rural, they tried to do their best to get island-like environments, really it was rural and, and other environments. I kind of hybridized it, but you should begin to show a reduction in cases, hospitalizations, positive tests, positivity tests, and fatality rates starting at 10 to 14 days after enactment. That was in the Lancet. So obviously that didn't happen in Guam. It went the other way. On Guam, there's been an increase in cases, Hospitalizations have more or less been steady, but a lot of people have died. Remember, once you go into the ICU, you have up to a 70% chance of never making it out. The positivity rates and fatality rates are increasing, and the current rate is 1.95%. That's the case fatality rate. And they are increasing. The U.S. case fatality rate is approximately 2.72 and appears to be decreasing. All right, the lockdown... In summary, the lockdown appears to be unsuccessful and may have accelerated transmission and deaths despite decreased mobility among residents. And that was documented. If you go to the um, Apple website, you can see travel through Guam. So um, I think it's fairly obvious to all of you that it's not working, didn't work, and why it works, uh, why, it's, why there has not been an adequate explanation is is something that you probably understand more than I do. I apologize for the extra word, I'll delete it. Um, so most COVID related, it, the deaths in context, most COVID related deaths occur in the over 60 to 65 population, which is about 10% of Guam. So, you know, in context, you lock down 90% of the island to protect 10%. and. There may, there's something to be said noble about that, but that is, as you've seen, is a very impractical um, uh, endeavor. So as of today, or maybe uh, yesterday, there are 57 COVID deaths on Guam and with 84 projected deaths by December 31st. And this is as best as I can get from entities that are tracking Guam. Um, without COVID, however, there are about 2.77 deaths per day on Guam about 10, about 1,000 a year, or 83 deaths per month. So mind you, you're at 50, and the mean age of death for COVID in the U.S. is 78 years of age. I haven't had time to compute it uh, for uh, Guam, and the average age of death on Guam is about nine, 79 years of age. Again, I apologize. The average age on Guam is 31 years of age, and GMHA and GRMC still have capacity to handle additional cases. So I tried to, I, what you may or may not see in this slide is that um, many of the cases that are COVID related may just be in their phase of natural death. We call it allowing natural death at a certain point of their age. They may have been incidentally infected with COVID. It may have been a false positive. And of course there are some where COVID exacerbated in, in, you know, uh, underlying disease. But when you look at, for example, the death rate in the United States, and you realize that the average age is 78 of those who die, um, when they actually get into detail, 
since the average age of death in the U.S. is about 79 to 80, many, many of those deaths aren't even COVID related, uh, aren't even caused by COVID. They're the incidental or suspected cases, and some are not even tested. Okay, so getting close to the time I have, if I can get this to move. Um, so some recommendations, and I think many of you may agree or disagree. I think like Florida, you end the lockdown. Um, the public health people and the governor said they will never ever lock down again. I mean, this is like a, a this is like a, a politician saying I, there will be no more taxes. He said, I will never ever lock, lock down again. I think he said, I swear it. Because it was so bad. It was terrible for the economy. Of course, there was escalations and suicides. And mind you, Guam has the highest suicide rate in, in, the, in, the, in the US. And um, he, you know, you allow businesses to open, again, typos. You mandate mask wearing. I believe in masks and hand washing, social distancing, et cetera. It probably makes a difference of about 15%. Um, at the least. And um, there is something to be said about you wearing a mask, although masks tend to protect people from spreading COVID, you know, on a molecular level or on a, on a, a microscopic level, it's like stopping mosquitoes with a cyclone fence. However, for those who cough and want to, and are going to spread large sputum samples and inoculum, it does bring it down. And when you wear a mask, you don't get inoculated by that. You don't inhale that large inoculum and your body has time to deal with it, is better able to handle maybe a million viruses versus 10 million. You continue to protect the vulnerable, which initially <laughs> I calculated could have been done in the hotels. Um, but um, you encourage for the businesses, you encourage improved ventilation. Multiple studies have shown that open circuit HVAC systems have um, markedly reduced viral loads. And that includes just putting, for those who don't have um, large budgets, you can just put a couple of uh, fans in the window to pull air out. And that's that, you know what it's like when there's smoke in a, or, or cooking smoke in a, in a business. You continue to invest in PCR testing, tracing, but start antibody testing. Uh, you open and you, and you invest in the, and soon to be available, the rapid um, five minute, even less tests of saliva which, it, which can be pooled, anterior nares testing, and use them at schools and ports of entry. Uh, for the airport, uh, this talk about screening people at the airport, forcing them to take PCR tests really don't, doesn't make much sense because it actually takes about four or five days for you to become bona fide positive more than 50%. For the first couple of days, and certainly on day zero, you will be, you will, even if you're infected, there will be no evidence of infection. I think your best bet, if I was to, you know, make it practical and try to encourage tourism, is use the same high-quality thermal screens you see, you, who've got, those who've gone to Manila, where they have nurses manning them, and they lock on every person that walks down, and it gives a temperature, and then they can pull them offline, uh, do, you know, do some vital signs, and perhaps, and very soon, you will have the rapid anterior nares and the pool, uh, saliva test. Which, will, which I have heard will, can get positive as soon as three minutes to five minutes. So it shouldn't cause much of a problem. And what is, you know, what's going around? You encourage the population to take vitamin D supplements, possibly zinc, and you encourage the medical community to use hydroxychloroquine, um, zinc and antibiotics for early infections and with or without steroids. The docs know what to do and um, that hydroxychloroquine is hard, Hydroxychloroquine is hard to keep in stock and, and hard to get in Florida because it's being used up so rapidly. And that may be contributing to the decreased uh, infection rate um, in, in Florida. I didn't show that graph, but the rates are plummeting. Okay, I'm just going to put up a basic disclaimer that my discussion on dosing and medications is for informational and educational purposes only, and it doesn't constitute a physician patient relationship, et cetera. For those, you have a board member in the crowd and I don't want to get in trouble. Okay, um, Trump was obviously a fan of hydroxychloroquine. They say sometime in May, he stopped taking it. 
but he did take it for several weeks or a period of, I think it was two weeks when he was exposed to, uh, to, the, uh, to COVID. Now, the data is unclear as to whether or not hydroxychloroquine prevents COVID. I personally take it as do a lot of other physicians and you only take it one time a week, but the data is very clear that it helps. Anyway, Trump made a remarkable recovery uh, with unproven therapies, unproven therapies, and those are monoclonal antibodies and remdesivir. When you look at the data, it's not very exciting, especially remdesivir, um, why, uh, but they're politically correct medications. And then proven therapies, dexamethasone, which probably made the biggest difference. And you get kind of a dexamethasone high, which is why he was kind of very um, animated towards the end of his treatment. He may have been given undisclosed medications such as hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, and others, which we don't know, but I can tell you that the data is showing that cocktails, including uh, those two, can make you, can uh, have been shown to have PCR positivity in five days in many patients and ra radically reduce hospitalizations and death. He had been taking, and what he disclosed he had been taking is vitamin D, Famotidine, known as Pepsid, and that is a molecule which is shown to have anti-COVID effects and antiviral effects. Melatonin, probably at night, and vitamin C, which optimizes his immune system. So let me go back to the vitamin D. Um, Florida is, quote, the sunshine, sunshine state. But, and we all have, and in the United States, there are 40% uh, of the population on average is, is deficient. But in my patient population, it's probably more like 70 and 80%. So we're giving everybody D. And elevated D levels has been shown to improve survival in COVID as well as reduce infection. And it reduces infection. In other words, high levels of vitamin D in similar populations, those with high levels have a 30 to 40% reduction. Mind you, that's about the rate that some vaccines are considered effective. Um, you check with your doctor, but vitamin D3, four to 5,000 I units a day is what some recommend. Vitamin C, you can pick your dose. Zinc, melatonin, and famotidine. I've been reluctant to give doses. And that's pretty much it. So thank you. And if there's any questions, I'd be willing to entertain them. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, George, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Fred Black, I, I don't see your picture, but I, I'm not very good. Yeah, I got to figure out. I, I figured out how to do it before. Maybe I'll do it later. But let's. Talk. I see your uh, very interesting slides. Uh, interesting. You make the uh, statement that uh, isolating in the home can actually be more dangerous. And what we have going on in Guam is that the focus is all all the incoming people on flights, of which uh, less than one percent turn out to be positive testing. And yet we're locking up 100% of those. And then the people on island that are residents that do test positive, they're all told to go home. I mean, they could uh, possibly get a hotel if they wanted, but 99% uh, of them are just going home. So it seems like we're investing millions of dollars uh, incarcerating people coming on island that are, are not at all infected, are very, very few. And yet the ones that are infected, we're, we're requiring them to go home, which according to your argument, could be disastrous for us all. So it's very interesting the point you make that you can actually get, uh, uh, there could be more danger due to the lockup because of people isolating at home. I've never heard that argument, but that's very interesting. Well, it's not my, my argument. It's what's being made around the world. And if you... If you research, if you look at comments about successful lockdowns, again, early, and I mean within days, kind of like Saipan did, um, lockdowns will work. You can actually burn out these little cases and clusters and there's no further um, transmission. But what has been found in most of the world is that precisely that happens. You begin to confine people in close spaces with, highly, with a highly infectious disease and they get worse. Now, how it, how it happens on Guam, I think, you know, I, I've been, I was advised to avoid controversy or discussions of corruption, as it were, but it's, it's driven probably by finance. Um, I, what I am telling you, the doctors know on Guam. It's nothing, they can read the same stuff I read. So it obviously makes no sense to 
do what they're doing with arriving passengers. And obviously it has a chilling effect, inf effect on any type of tourism. It, Dr. Dr. George, Mackers, I'm oh, sorry, go sorry. ahead. Bob, go ahead. So um, it seemed to me that you had uh, an interesting uh, uh, hint earlier on of, uh, uh, and combine that with Fred's comment, if we put the old folks in the hotels and let all the arriving passengers go home, it seems that it would not change the cost function. And yet from what your si slides intimate, that might be more effective. Actually, when it first, when they first started this, and when it, I did some calculations and I set them on, uh, on uh, the, uh, the point. And what you calculated the available empty hotel rooms on Guam, you calculated those uh, people in that age population who would be willing to leave their homes or lived in multi-generational housing. And that's kind of the answer as to why you get infections in interfamilial spread and say, come to a hotel room, you know, they're COVID negative. Inst give them, don't force them, give them the opportunity to say, in, for example, the Pacific Star or the well, whatever, maybe Beach. give them an open bar and keep everybody out. <laughs> and you probably would have, you probably would end up with a, uh, with less mortality. But um, obviously, sooner or later, they want to see their family members and they would not, um, you know, Americans and, and Guamanians, after a while, they just don't want to be told what to do. And you know how things are enforced on Guam. Someone's going to hug somebody and it would spread. So yeah. uh, honestly, okay. you can reverse, we call it reverse isolation. And hmm. that, that in theory could work, but obviously it's uh, more of a theory than reality. Okay. Thank you. Uh, George, uh, this is Tom Poole. Um, I, I loved your talk um, first and thank you so much for the effort. Uh, would we be able to get a copy of this slide just because the, your presentation uh, I promise not to share it, but I would love to be able to study it in, in greater depth. Um, if if that's okay, I would love to have a copy of it. Um, well, I believe it's going to be posted, and, and thank you for the compliment. I believe it's going to be posted. I just may have a little, um, and, and it's probably being recorded. So, But if you just email me, uh, I'll send okay. you a copy. Will do. And, uh, but, yeah, it's just Dr. Macris online at Gmail. It's easy. To Bob's point, I would like to, you know, underscore that that there's two things that this disease is: its age and its comorbidities. And those two go together. As you get older, you have more comorbidities. But there's been, there's been some nice work done looking at the people that get this disease that are old and don't have comorbidities. And it's clear that it's the comorbidities that is the much bigger risk factor than than just simply age, which is like probably why you know, President Trump skipped out of there in a couple of days in addition to the things that, that, that you mentioned. I wanted to ask specifically about your case fatality rate because it looks really high to me at 2.7%. You know, and I'm thinking we've got a different, and I know there are different definitions out there on case fatality rate. I think the traditional one is the number die uh, relative to all of those who are diagnosed, you know, part over whole times 100. And so we've had whatever it is, 58 deaths, something like that, and, and roughly 50,000 positive tests. And so that's about a 0.1% traditional case fatality rate. So I'm wondering if your case fatality rate is based on hospitalized patients or symptoms patients, or do you know what your denominator is there? It's, it's what the University of Minnesota calculated based on the data from Guam. I honestly, um, I wanted to sit down and break down every age group and, and, and do the math. And, but this is, I'm just not giving you my cat, I'm giving you what's publicly posted that the, anybody could look at. That's from the University of uh, Minnesota website where they took deaths and did the math. That's but completely you, goofy. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, well, you know, one of the, the, the trending is, is okay, but this is, what, this is what is reported and unfortunately, Try as you may, you can't get information from public health. But when you look at, um, you know, but it's kind of consistent with other jurisdictions. But when you actually calculate the infection fatality rate, obviously it's probably way less than 1%. And then when you break it down by age, you have, um, you, have uh, you know, breakdowns where the young people are almost rarely die and the, old, and the older patients with risk, factor, which risk factors do. But I made no attempt to alter the public um, reputable graphs. And, um, you know, that's, 
the only disclaimer I have. This is George. Uh, I'm sitting here looking at the civil defense numbers. They send those to me, and this was as of October second. That was the last total I had. And Guam had forty eight thousand five hundred and one positive tests, <laughs> and I think we had fifty three deaths at that point. So that's that's about a 0.1 percent case fatality rate under the traditional definition of case right. fatality rate. So Minnesota is doing something else. They're they're looking at something other than the positive tests. Yeah, you're right. And uh, you know, actually, there's definitions, and I'm not. I, I I'm not. You know, uh, that's a good point, and I should have I should have commented on that. But the trending, the trending, I think is 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 that Guam is. The lockdown has gotten worse, and even if you adjust for that, you'll probably see that the infection and the infectivity rate, which actually drives all other processes, has increased, if not gotten worse. George, thank you very much. Right, and while you're on the line, I have a question for you. They're doing their canine tests all over, and there is some suggestion they might be able to pick up active COVID patients um, to make life easy, like to give dual duty to the airport dogs who, where they miss the person who's, who's febrile. Um, what's the status of that? Yeah, that has been, uh, there are actually some countries that have already got those dogs trained and, and are using them. And supposedly from what I've been reading, the early reports is that their success rate is quite good and, and better than uh, our tests, which, you know, we have a really high false positive rate uh, with this, uh, you know, 20 minute, and it's even less than that, as, as you say, PCR test, uh, uh, polymerase chain reaction test. So I think it's good, and, and I'm a big believer in dogs, and, I'm, and I have sort of learned a bit of a lesson. I, I was in Cambodia working when they said, we're gonna take these mutts and uh, just street dogs and train them to detect mines. And I said, oh, there's no way. I said, we spend 50,000 bucks for each, you know, Belgian Malinois, we, we recruit for the army and that sort of thing. You can't just take street dogs. I was wrong. And then we did the same thing here on Guam. We took boonie dogs and trained them to find coconut rhinoceros beetles. And I said, you guys can't do that. We have these really expensive trainers that have to train our dogs. You can't just, and I was wrong about that too. Those, those uh, coconut rhinoceros beetle dogs did fantastic. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if these dogs can detect that. So for Guam, for the business community to get tourists in, there may be a light, you know, the, the, op, the, the option may be a combination of the, the dogs that, you know, kind of sniff through the luggage while people are standing there. And there may also be the, and then of course, thermal scanning, and then the ability of the five minute uh, anterior nares, the anterior portion of your nose or saliva test for people that'll pulled offline. And then of course you can, for a $5 test, a three to $5 test, you can probably, you know, it may be worth just, you know, giving it for free for those who, would like to submit to the testing. But thank you for that clarification. And thank you for pointing out the graph, uh, the graph numbers. I, I should have brought that out, but again, I, I'm not gonna alter the University of Minnesota's <laughs> tracking. <laughs> well, just before we leave that, just, just quickly, I'll just read you the, the definition for case fatality rate. And it is an epidemiology, a case fatality rate is the proportion of deaths from a certain disease compared to the total number of people people diagnosed with the disease for a particular period. So, so I don't know how they can get from 0.1% to 2.7%. They're, they're obviously looking at something other than the total number of uh, people tested right. positive. And, and it's gotta be hospitalized the the, or something. The definition is in the text and I didn't pull that out, but it's consistent. But you know, for everybody listening, I think uh, Tom, I think you would agree that um, based on numerous antibody studies, which is why we're suggesting it, the population on Guam may be reaching, um, you know, at least 10 times, if there are what, at least 10 times the infection, the, the diagnosed, di the confirmed infection rate, which I thought was, let, I thought it was more like 3,000. But anyway, you can multiply that by 10 or even up to 50. So if you assume 30,000 people now have antibodies, um, the there's a, um, I think I mentioned it previously, there's a, what's commonly called the herd immunity target. And I think the, what, um, what, what's been going on is that you're seeing such in places like Florida and other places, the, in, the mortality and infectivity rate drop rapidly because probably 30 to 60% of the population is already resistant or prone to be resistant, especially if they have you know, adequate nutrition and vitamin C 
30 to 60 percent, and perhaps 15 percent of that is accounted for by social distancing reduction in rate. So between 30 and 60 percent, and once, once you reach, for example, 20 to 30 percent of the population infected and as low as 15 percent, as has been shown in other countries, you you reach herd immunity. You that's do exactly not need exactly. to infect everybody. You that's actually exactly have, right. and that's why people in that people listening to this who are healthy, they've probably sniffed coronavirus already, and it has been killed in their nasopharynx by their own immune system without triggering their body to even respond. Um, let alone those who respond asymptomatically and develop antibodies. Which brings us to the vaccine, which I'm hoping is available um, this month or soon, because at least with the, uh, several of them have shown, once they're injected and with subhuman primates, you can inoculate the subhuman primates, the monkeys, with active virus, and they never, I'm sure. them, they never get it in their lungs. So I'm done, thank you. Hey doc, this is Steve, yep. I got a question. Can you guys I'm see ready. me? I'm ready. I can hear you. Okay. So my, my question is in the beginning, you know, we didn't know how far and who it would spread to, but I think that the statistics are kind of proving out who's in the highest risk category. And I think that we went into these lockdowns simply because we didn't know what kind of capacity we could have to match the demand for those who are infected and needed that type of medical treatment. So my question is today, is the focus in the wrong direction right now with closing down and closing down? And it shouldn't it be more like, what does Guam have as far as capacity to handle the situation? And in looking in that direction saying, you know, we have enough ventilators, we have enough beds, we have enough resources, we have enough um, <clears throat> uh, travel doctors, et cetera, to handle it, we can open the community rather than just keep on taking these steps forward and backwards without any real solution. And you know, let me go back. Uh, there was a consultant that I had uh, brought in to, to Guam who they owned hospitals and they actually managed hospitals. And it was for the SDA clinic because they were going to build a, um, they wanted to build an extension to the clinic, uh, an, or basically a new clinic. And that, uh, that consultant went to the hospital during that time. It is Dr. Gatewood, who is the chair. <clears throat> and uh, the hospital was in code red for not enough beds. And he went into the hospital. He had already gone to the Navy and, and got their opinions and, and their facts on what they were going to do. They're only going to build a 30-bed hospital for all the military here. And GRMC wasn't built yet, but uh, he had talked to Pete Scrow, and then he went to GMH. So long story short is he asked the board members, why are you in code red? They said, we don't have enough beds. And then he said, let me ask you a simple question. How many beds are out of commission just simply for a small mechanical issue, maybe the call button? And that's why you're not using it, 15 or 20. And how many beds are being occupied because <clears throat> doctors don't uh, have confidence in the charge nurses, et cetera, to go ahead and, um, and uh, let, them, let them go. They have to wait for the doctors to come, maybe 15 or 20. And then there was, I think there was another 20 beds at skilled nursing. So the consultant said, actually you have access to between 35 and 50 beds and each bed is worth a million dollars. Uh, why don't you just fix these problems and get out of code red? So my question today is, do we have the capacity now uh, along with the military so that we can go in a different direction and say, we have capacity, so we shouldn't have to worry as much. Um, we just would like to make sure that we can give accommodation to those who are most likely to be um, infected, those with the comorbidities and some of the other issues that we talked about. And as a result of that, maybe we could come up with a way of helping to distinguish those who are more um, delicate, so to speak. So we have handicap signs, so people know how, who's a handicapped person, where they park, et cetera, but there's no way we can distinguish behind the mask who needs more help. <clears throat> so maybe we'll make a mask called Mask Maulik yeah. and create a, a different designed for it so even when the tourist comes in they know to give these people more accommodation more room the businesses know how to give more accommodation and more room give them plastic gloves when they come in because everybody touches produce everybody touches the handle on the freezer 
at the supermarkets and they all handle stuff at the gasoline station, the three most essential areas that are always open and you're going to bring it home. So uh, I guess since it's going to hit everybody, can we start to focus on identifying those who don't mind being identified with a certain kind of mask? We all wear masks, let's say, to, if it helps out. But do we have the capacity that we shouldn't be that worried? And if we don't, wouldn't that be the focus of where we need to go now, since we have this much data and this much immunity built? What do you think? Well, I think uh, sooner or later, you're going to see the rates come down because you are going to reach that herd immunity threshold. But I think the, ho the hospital has adequate capacity, especially if you get GRMC to fully cooperate and you hold off on elective procedures that would in that would either take a bed or have the possibility of taking a bed. I think I, he I heard they bought the million dollar tent. I don't know where that applies. Regarding uh, the, the, uh, the nursing facility, skilled nursing facility, you would only put people there who, let's say, lived in multi-generational houses or had crowded households just to let them become COVID negative. You would not put a sick person there who was not at the very end or already recovered because COVID cases turn radically, they can turn, they go through a period as, for example, President Trump tonight could go into respiratory distress. They can get very ill seven to 10 days out. But I, um, I think you're ready to open up. You've, obviously things can't get worse. And what, what, what has been shown, if you look at the graphs and I, you know, if the numbers are wrong, the trends are, make sense. You, can, you, you may actually see everything come down as you begin to spread people out again and have more casual contact among infected and non-infected individuals as who would pass in the supermarket or in a store than uh, intimate contact in confined spaces with, for example, young people. They're not social distancing. And as you mentioned, businesses will, will adapt. For example, in Florida, there's no restriction anymore on restaurants. You can put, you can fill it completely. But the restaurants have opted to space things out a little bit because our behavior has changed. People feel uncomfortable. And what each business has kind of adapted to that full bore, no restriction by setting their own. And um, so restaurants that had very close tables are spreading them out a little bit more because people feel more comfortable and they won't walk in, people will not walk in a, a crowded restaurants. And I think it's time to make that happen in Guam. You find your level. And of course, um, you know, you have there are resources and and you, the capabilities to handle any surge. And I think the I think the surge is over, the spikes are over. Infection is running through the community. Whatever you see as positive rates, you can multiply that times 10. And we're getting closer and closer to having less infections because there have already been more, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So do do you have an idea on how many hospital beds at GMH are non-functional or what the percentage of rooms could be available if doctors were able to get around to uh, uh, letting their patients go earlier? And how would that, in your opinion, affect uh, the community and understanding that we don't have a, a medical supply capacity issue? And because in the end, that's really what, it, to me, it boils down to now. So we're all gonna get it and either be sick a little or not at all or very sick. And if I'm very sick, do we have the capacity to treat it? And, and once we know that that's okay, and that's the course of life, because everybody's going to eventually run into the virus, then I think we can, we can have a better plan than the way it's kind of currently being viewed at right now. What do you think? Well, uh, I, I can't give you exact numbers. And a broken bed is quite different than a bed that can't be used. And again, if you increase, if you include GRMC and have them fully cooperate rather than reluctantly cooperate with care, um, I think you have more than enough capacity. But it's time to just, and I, you don't know how and what the, what the motives are. Someone has, you know, they're in a deer in the headlights mentality regarding what to do. And certainly you can wait long enough so that eventually the vulnerable who are vulnerable will either get infected or die and the numbers will, numbers will come down by the herd immunity way, or you can open up and and then, you know, I think the numbers will go down because 
even bars and clubs, as it were, will have limitations which should be strictly enforced. It doesn't mean Guam opens full bore. It just means it opens with restrictions. And in Florida, it's opened up on the state level. There are no restrictions, but mayors and various municipalities can make their own decisions. And again, yeah. businesses are going to make those decisions. When they see too many seats packed together, don't bring in customers. And when they spread them out a little bit more, they do, you know, you'll find your level and you might as well start testing it now than later. Thank you. Appreciate that, Doc. You're welcome. All right, if there's no further any questions. Oh. Media, does the media have any questions before we end it? No? Okay, cool. Thank you, Doc. Oh, go ahead. All right. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. And you can send questions to Dr. Macris online at Gmail if you have any. Phil, did you have a question? Well, I noticed Dr. Lamstrom was online. If he wanted to add anything to it, at least he was before. And Dr. Garbowski. Okay. Still... Okay. Thanks, George. Okay, then. You're welcome. Thank you again. Yeah, Thank you really for uh, staying up late for us. My pleasure. And uh, enjoy the rest of the debate if it's still on. I'm virtually in Guam every day. <laughs> Very great. Thank you so much. Um, if there's nothing else by our members, uh, we'll call the meeting over. Uh, we're at past our one o'clock. Uh, thank you all for joining us this week again. And I'll keep you posted on any other events that happen uh, regarding to Rotary. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Good job, George. Right. Appreciate you talking and uh, give me a call when you come to town. We'll have a beer. Or even before. Thank you very much. Um, okay. And okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you all next week. Bye. Thank Bye. you.